Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of Tech Tickle. I asked my Twitter followers what they wanted to see next. I was deciding between build vlog number 10 right back to back to build vlog number 9, or I was going to give you an AMD Zen Vega rundown and give you my thoughts on all the news we've heard so far. And then I thought, uh, why not do both? <laughs> So basically what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to put together this system that's in front of me and I don't think you can see most of it right now and concurrently give you my thoughts. So before we get into my thoughts about all the AMD shit going on in this here first quarter 2017, let's go over the part list ahead of time so you guys know what to expect as I tinker with this bullshit. So to start, we got ourselves this motherboard here. Uh, this is a Gigabyte GAH61M-S2H numbers and letters that mean something I'm sure to somebody but they're just total bullshit to the average consumer with a Sandy Bridge i5 2400 inside and 8 gigs of RAM. Pretty standard combo. I use this a lot. Next up in the component list, we have a SSD right here in a ADATA uh, 3.5 inch adapter bracket that I got for free. The drive itself cost me $30. It's 160 gigabytes. If I didn't already mention that in the last few seconds, I have a goldfish memory. And uh, that will be the boot drive for this system, but it's a little small for, uh, you know, storing games and shit. So in addition, I'm going to throw this uh, WD Green 500 gigabyte hard drive in as well. That will serve as a secondary drive, and I paid a grand total of $10 for that. And then we got our Kelf, a GTX 670. It's featured in my last build log video, actually. I couldn't put it in, though, because I... I just didn't want to use non-standard connectors or adapters to make a fucking eight pin turn into two six pins, even though that's actually the safest configuration you can employ. That would have been fine. I just don't like it. I don't like that. I wanted to just do something a little bit more organic. So I put a 970 in that build, and with this one, I'll be going with the 670. It will all be housed in a micro ATX case. This thing right here, I'm not going to lift up for you because it'll make everything shake. And, uh, oh, of course, yes, this whole thing is going to be powered by the FX 550M from Corsair that was uh, used. Worst case, still under warranty. Uh, obviously going to be sufficient for this build with plenty of room to spare. Anyway, now that you know what's included in this fucking thing, let me get to work, and I can very slowly and methodically give you my thoughts on the upcoming AMD releases. We have Zen on the horizon, I think we'll start there. Looks to have roughly the same IPC as Broadwell, which means it has pretty much the same IPC as Skylake and KB Lake, which is only a sliver higher. So it'll be competitive on that front. The clocks look to be about the same as Broadwell E, which is also encouraging. Looks like the engineering samples are up to about 3.6 gigahertz right now. The retail samples will probably be around there at stock speeds, and you can expect the smaller consumer-oriented chips to probably match Skylake in terms of their overclockability. I don't know, it took Intel a lot of effort to get KB Lake where it is, and topping out at five gigahertz. Uh, but anyhow, looks like Zen is going to be competitive in terms of at least performance. That's what we know so far. What we don't know is pricing. And now let me talk mostly about that because that's what's important here. It's not so much that AMD is putting up a fight against Intel on the performance front because we knew they would be capable of that. The technology was there. R&D is getting cheaper as time goes on and they're playing catch up. So this is old news for Intel, but it's whether or not they can price their chips competitively. And there are a couple of things that might be stopping them from doing that. Number one, Intel fabricates their own processors, which is expensive actually. It actually results in a huge one-time capital investment that a lot of companies couldn't afford. But in the case of Intel, it's already bought and paid for, and now they are reaping the rewards because their product does not have an additional cost on production per unit like AMD's does. So being that they contract most of their work through global foundries, they're going to be paying a bit of a premium on the product for that reason, that reason alone. Now, does that mean they can't be competitive? No, it just means that they don't have quite as big of a cushion to cut into that Intel does. So being price competitive on that front alone would be challenging, but if you couple that with the fact that Intel is one of the 10 largest companies in the world in terms of cash on hand, and you have a real problem. They have about $35 billion in capital that they haven't spent yet. So a lot of hurdles there on price that uh, AMD is going to be facing. They don't have enough cash on hand. So even if they wanted to introduce their chips as loss leaders, the same way Walmart does with their discount, you know, buckets of soda or whatever else they have at the front of the store that are clearly marked down to try to get you in buying stuff. Uh, even if they want to do that, they couldn't because they don't have the money. Intel has the money. Now, if AMD comes out with a competitive product that really gives them a bloody nose, Intel is the one that's going to be cutting prices. They can say, you know what? You're right. 
AMD kind of beat us to the punch on this one. They came to market with a great chip. Let's say they offer their 8-core, 16-thread fucking maximum badassness for the price of an i7 consumer side these days. So uh, something like $450 here in Canada or whatever the fuck they sell for. I don't really keep up on that sort of stuff. Let's say they manage to do that. Let's say that they, they exploit the fact that Intel probably has a very large margin on their chips that they know they can cut into and they force them down. What next for AMD from a financial perspective? What are they going to say to their shareholders? Well, yeah, we, we could have been competitive in this marketplace, kept prices reasonably high, and had a good per unit return, but instead we decided to go to war with Intel, and now they're going to crush us in the next two years. So in addition to those problems, we have a third that sort of rears its ugly head, and that is the intricate dance that AMD and Intel do with each other in order to stay in business. Now, for those of you unaware, Intel kinda needs AMD to survive, because if it weren't for that x86 instruction set agreement that the two of them have, regulators would have stepped in and broken up Intel already, who is the much larger company, and they are absolutely in a position to put AMD out of business tomorrow if they wanted to, but they don't, because that would cut into their bottom line and eventually result in the company having to split. So this delicate little dance that they do, where they're trying to sort of keep AMD afloat, but at the same time not give them enough ammunition to sort of take over and be competitive in the marketplace, is needless to say a big problem for consumers and that's not going to change this time around. So Intel doesn't want to go to war with AMD for that reason because they know they'll win and AMD doesn't want to give Intel a kick in the face because they know that they risk the health of their company long term as a result. Sort of rocking a hard place for both parties and they kind of have to continue playing nice with one another if we're going to get anywhere. So what AMD really wants to achieve here is market parity. They just want to be successful enough that the shareholders are happy and they remain a viable company going forward into the future, but they don't want to piss Intel off and put them in a position where they have to be aggressive, buy them out, and give AMD a good night kiss. Now, what does this mean for consumers? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It means, generally speaking, you can expect that prices are going to be in line with what Intel has to offer. AMD is absolutely going to compete because they are in a position to do so and you will have options going forward. But if you expect this to bring the per core price of CPUs down, I think you're gonna be waiting a while for that to happen. But truthfully, it's not all doom and gloom. I don't mean to make it sound like it's the end of the world. I'm just saying, temper your expectations because we have a habit of being disappointed in the computing world, especially by AMD, and largely it's no fault of their own, I have to say. Now, Vega to me is the more interesting discussion topic, and I'll tell you why. We know a lot less about it, for one, which makes it interesting to someone like me, who is very much a market speculator. And number two, there's been a lot of misguided chatter on the internet that I just love to dispel. First of all, performance-wise, what we know about it is that it seems that in a Doom benchmark, it fell somewhere between a 1080 and a Titan XP, which is effectively 1080 Ti. So if that's the case, you've got yourself a 500 to 530 millimeter square die that is competing somewhere in between a die that's 314 square millimeters and 471. And of course, when it comes to GPUs, size does matter. The amount of transistors that you can pack on that thing, the amount of SPs or CUDA cores really matters. That's what results in this big fucking teraflop performance number and ultimately performance in games. And if AMD is bringing a 530 30 square millimeter die to the game and they can't even beat the Titan XP which is smaller, that's a big problem. But when I looked at the data a little closer, I realized that that benchmark and all the extrapolated data must have been bullshit. Now, I do believe the die size is accurate. Vega 10 is going to be big, there's no question about that. But what I don't believe is that suddenly this new architecture, Vega 10, is somehow going to be worse in terms of IPC and clock speed when compared to Polaris 10. That doesn't make any sense. Even if they just scaled Polaris 10 up uh, and made it two and a half times bigger, it should beat a Titan XP. There's no question about it. It, it itself beats a GTX 1060 60 and it's 30 square million meters bigger and it beats it by a sliver and a 1060 is just half of a 1080 although there's some back end in there that sort of takes up more space anyway the bottom line is there's no way that they compete with the gtx 1060 on that level and then fall completely flat on the higher end with the big fat chips and consider that amd is claiming that vega 10 is new it's, it's not polaris 10 just scaled up because if it were that would be fine but they they're claiming it's better it's something different entirely so will vega 
Omega 10 be able to beat the prospective 1080 Ti, which should roughly be a Titan XP? I don't think so right away. Drivers have a habit of sort of lagging behind if you're AMD. But if anything, I expect it to be much closer to the 1080 Ti than numbers are presently showing from that one solitary benchmark that I think was highly misleading. But all that said, let's say that Vega 10 is a success performance-wise. Let's say that it comes out and all the reviewers, all your Linus tech tips and your hardware Canucks and your fucking PC purrs and whoever the fuck else wants to get involved in it and get free samples that I don't. Let's say they say that the card is great and that it competes very uh, effectively and handily against the likes of your 1080 Ti, even if that's the case. Think about this. How long are they gonna have that crown for, do you think? Because by the math, given the 19 month release cycle that Nvidia currently employs, Volta's gonna be out by November to January. So maybe five, six months of AMD on top before Nvidia comes along and kicks them in the teeth again. What AMD really needs right now is a magic genie to come along and go, aha! Yeah, as you go, you got an extra year in your belt right there. We're gonna freeze time for a whole fucking year and give you an opportunity to catch up. Now, excuse my uh, stuttered manner of speaking. I'm trying to also build a computer, but I think you've uh, effectively gathered my points on this. It's not so much that I'm worried about AMD's performance, both with Zen and with Vega in the short term, because I think they truly are going to be competitive this year in 2017. My concern is the long-term financials. I just don't see them making a lot of money from these strides is the problem. Oh, look at that. I lost 100 pounds. I gained like maybe like 15 of it back and this is the result. Still got the guns from all the lifting, but I gotta get this off in the summer. I gotta get married later this year. Y'all are invited in video form. We're gonna try and film it. Show you guys what's going on. I don't think I'm gonna benchmark this one at all. I don't see a reason to, really. I mean, you guys know how a GTX 670 and an i5 2400 are going to perform because I think I made this exact build in build vlog number two. Time to delete all these partitions that were here before. I don't need your partition, you fucking whore. So I don't think I went over all the prices here when I was giving you the part rundown, so let's do that now. We got motherboard for 50 bucks. We got RAM modules for 10 bucks a piece. We got CPU for $80. Uh, we got that hard drive I factored in as 10 bucks. Again, it was a part of that whole package thing. Uh, got the graphics card, GTX 670. That was $80. And the power supply, the CX550M, I bought last night for 40 bucks. Oh, and the SSD came out of my standard stash. That was $30 for that particular unit. Ow. Unless my math is off, that puts us for a total of $310 for this build that is presently installing Windows. And I think we'll call that one a video. I hope you liked my disorganized thoughts on AMD's bullshit. I really hope they do succeed, and I hope they figure this thing out long term. Because like I said, the biggest battle for them is going to be beyond 2017. They need to be able to keep pace on both fronts. They can't do it on minimal resources, and they can't do it being the third largest company in this fucking three-way waltz. Anyhow, this is Tech Tickle. I am Ofa. Follow me on Twitter at Ofa. Follow me on everything at Ofa. And check out the Steam group, which is linked below. And look forward to my 5,000 subscriber giveaway, which will happen when we get 500 more subscribers. Yeah? Stay tuned for all that, and I'll see you soon.